Galbunga, <gasps> dude. Hey everyone, it's Don Shoot Corleone here, and I am here with yet another brand new rant. And this rant is going to be for yet another new release that came out this weekend. And as you can tell by the by what I'm wearing on my head, that's sometimes really hard to wear. The newest Ninja Turtles film that came out. And um, this obviously is going to be for this weekend's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. I don't think it should be called that, but we'll get to that part later. Let's just explain the plot and production process of the film. The plot of this movie is that this movie obviously follows the Turtle Brothers like every other adaptation as they were to earn the love of New York City while facing down an army of mutants. So, yeah, that's what it is. Well, how is this made? Well, we all know, the last one before this, Out of the Shadows bombed and thankfully destroyed the Michael Bay franchise for good. After only two crappy films. This one, how is this made? After Ramsey and Nadio's appointment at Nickelodeon in 2018, she and Brian Robbins discussed who to bring on to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise. Seth Rogen was decided upon, and Jeff Rowe joined the project soon after. Then in June 2020, Deadline Hollywood reported that Nickelodeon Animation Studio was developing a computer animated Turtles film for Paramount Pictures, marking Nickelodeon Animation's first CG animated theatrical production. And Raw was hired to direct. They formed a screenplay for Bernard O'Brien, Rogan, Evan Goldberg, and James Weaver, produced through their production company, Point Grey Pictures, and Alto and Josh Fagan oversaw production for Nickelodeon and Point Grey, respectively. Then in an August 2020 interview with Collider, Rogan stated that the film would lead heavily into the teenage element of Turtles. He stated that he was a lifetime fan of the Ninja Turtles, and the teenage part of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is always the part that stuck to him the most. And as someone who loved the teenage movies, and who and they made a lot of teenage movies, and who literally got their start in their entire profession by writing a teenage movie, the idea of kind of honoring the, in on the element was exciting for them, and not just respect, disregarding the rest, but really using it as kind of a jumping off point for the film. Then in June 2021, Rogan revealed a teaser image through his Twitter page, and it contained the school notes written by Leonardo and the film's original release date and other details. And then by October 2021, it was working, it was the working title Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Next Chapter. Then production designer Yashar Kasai elaborated on the project. That they anchor themselves enough in the familiar elements of its life they could easily recognize, but you either add to or enhance some of the existing charm of the franchise, and a title Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem was finalized by August 2022. And Kyle Spears joined the film as co-director, signing on because he had worked with Raw on the prior film, The Mitchells vs. the Machines, which I really loved. And J.J. Villard, creator of King Star King for Alice Swim, was commissioned for design the film's logo. So yeah. After the film was shot and cringily advertised, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem was screened as a work in progress of the Annecy International Animation Film Festival, on June 12, 2023, and was released by Paramount Pictures in the United States on August 2nd, 2023. And, um, it somehow received positive reviews from critics, 
who praised the vocal performances, script and stylized animation, and several critics named it the best turtle film. And then a sequel and a spin-off by television series for Paramount Plus were both in development already before the movie had even come out. They should have waited for the box office instead of doing it now. Before even confirming things that they probably don't like, how do we even know this is even gonna make a big profit? Wow. That's my reaction. Yeah, this was another movie, much like Insidious the Red Door, I had zero excitement for because when I saw the trailers, all of them were cringe. I mean, come on. The turtles literally sound way too damn young, and you're all just going to be like, dude, they're supposed to be teenagers. They're called the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They sound like pre-teenagers. Pre. They don't sound like teenagers at all in this. And Donald Tuttle literally sounds like he's more eight years old than a teenager. Ralph sounds like a typical, Raphael sounds like a typical middle school bully. Michelangelo literally sounds like some 12th grade or college age stoner. And Leonardo just sounds like a typical, stereotypical high school pussy. Many adaptations make them sound more like teenagers way better, even when they're voiced by adult actors. In some of them. Lots of ones make them sound better as teenagers. Lots. And then I saw the reactions to the movie. And I was just facepalming that people literally thought this was better than the 1990 film. Which is still and always will be the best film adaptation of the Turtles. Because it managed to capture both the comic and cartoon tone. And show that Team NT wasn't just for kids. Like some people think it is. And now you're to the 2003 show as well, which even gets darker as it progresses. Anyways, back to this movie. I saw the movie last night, and how was it? Was it the best one like you all think I'm going to say? Fuck no! Hey, fine, it's not as bad as 2014 on Ninja Turtles 3, but it's still shit. I still thought it was cringe. And then... Yeah, you guys can say, but but you loved Mitchell's vs. the Machines. This is by the same director as this. Same director. That's by the same director as this movie. How could you not like this but like that movie? <sighs> Want to know why I like that movie? It was heartfelt. It was original. It had a perfect message, perfect characters, and a perfect story you could be invested in. This, this was none of that. And that's, and Mitchell's isn't part of this review, guys. I'm reviewing this movie. How could you go from Mitchell's to this, Jeff? Just how? That quickly. After a great directional debut, this is the next thing you chose? Like, what was this? Like, first of all, the animation, it was just not great. Most of the designs were horrible. Like in the beginning scene, Baxter Stockman, Baxter Stockman literally looks like a damn hobo. And most of the townspeople look like hobos. What, is all of New York homeless now all of a sudden? Even April O'Neil literally looks like a hobo. As well, and there's another part of Ariel, uh, April we're going to get to in a bit. <sighs> like, maybe like the first half had some moments, but it was just this mindless film with failed jokes. Some of the messages got forced, and the plot felt very, very rushed. The Turtles were just acting the same. They don't even have any distinct personalities from previous adaptations. April looks nothing like April. Yeah, guys, April actually is black in this adaptation. And she looks too damn young for a high schooler. If she's a high schooler, why does she look like she's middle school aged? It literally looks as if she's a different character. That's not the April O'Neil I know. April O'Neil's a grown up and a news reporter. Splinter is even turned into a joke with hair design, curly hair on his head. To the point where he barely even looks like a rat anymore. 
And the classic villains were just ruined and they had no time design to shine. In fact, Bebop and Rocksteady are in this movie. And there's something different about them. They're now actually end up becoming the good guys. No, they're not supposed to be that. They work for the Shredder in their adaptation. Everything I've seen of them, they, they work with the Shredder and are some of the Turtles' enemies. Since when was this of necessary all of a sudden? I would yeah, I get the writers were trying to make changes and make something of their own, but these changes did not work. I was a look, guys. I was a huge Team and T fan when I was a kid. That and, this and Team and T and Sonic were some of my biggest childhood icons in comic book or video game or a cartoon. Right? These these four were a childhood icon with Sonic. But I'm not going to defend every single movie adaptation that comes out. This movie was still garbage. It was literally made for today's generation and not even trying to pay homage to other better variations by any means. Yeah, we all know they wanted to use teenagers to voice the turtles because the turtles are teenagers, but... That's apocryphal because Donatello does not even sound like a teenager. He sounds like a darn kid. Another thing about Donatello. Stop giving Donatello glasses. What is with Nickelodeon constantly feeling like they need to give Donatello nerdy glasses? They give him nerdy glasses in the Michael Bay films. And now they give him nerdy glasses in this. What is with that now all of a sudden? Does suddenly Donatello need to wear glasses because he probably can't see shit without them when fighting enemies? Probably. Just poor voice casting on a lot of characters, and the story's a little boring. There's two exceptions I can make in the cast, but that's going to come later. I just have no idea who else is even for. It's just like... All this is just some not that creative story as if they had a gold script and didn't want to risk it. There was even an attempt to make milking funny. Okay, I kind of forgot that. Yeah, because one of the thing, reasons why Splinter doesn't let them go out in this adaptation is because he fears the turtles are going to get milked. Yeah, they joke of milking in this. Milking the turtles. Now, I don't know why you came. It's kind of like this movie, Milking and Nickelodeon, Milking the Turtles for more money. Now, to what we are here for, Mutant Mayhem. So, where they now just try to be all Spider Verse now because now every movie needs to copy into the Spider Verse so that's animation. Like Hollywood likes to copy everything that's successful without realizing why it's successful in the first place. And the turtles even are designed badly. They have weird heads and eyes. And Michelangelo literally looks like the worst designed turtle of all of them. Leonardo at least looks looks like some of his other cartoon counterparts. Donatello looks a little too beefy. No, no, no. That's not, that's not Donatello. Raphael looks a little too beefy. Donatello looks the same if you take out the shitty glasses. And stop giving him glasses for once. Michelangelo is the worst designed of all of them. He's shorter, even though he's not even the shortest. None of them, all of them are the same size. He's not even that short. And he just sounds like a grown stoner. There's some fine, there's fine music at our times, but it just felt kind of there. And all the jokes. What was so funny about this? This all the jokes in here were cringy. There's they were just trying to be relevant, but when I watch Team and T, it's I want to be taken to another world, not brought back to this one. Most of the jokes were just forced and not natural, such as the anime reference and stuff, or that. Or how about there's this line where Leonardo's like, "Come on, guys, we're going grounded. Let's just go home." And then Donatello's like, I bet Leo has his head up Splinter's butt. 
and his farts probably smell like cheese and Doritos. Wow, that is so funny. Yeah, I love thinking of a night, thinking of a joke where Leo would have his head up Splinter's ass. And Splinter's farts smelling like cheese and Doritos. There's even one where they're discussing where the turtles are discussing their plan to stop Superfly, and they start speaking in dumb rap language. And get this, guys. Mikey, along with it, even literally starts twerking his ass cheeks like this for three seconds. And literally, it looks like as if he's wearing a thong. Yeah, an orange thong between his ass. Yeah, so pretty much having the cringy kitty humor of other kid movies today. And you also, you want to know something, you want to know something else about April O'Neil? She's now afraid of cameras, of talking in front of cameras now. Because the last time she tried that, apparently, a backstory revealed that she got nervous and vomited. And, she, and she's like showing vomiting for like three minutes. Yeah, three whole damn minutes of her barfing. And it went viral and humiliated her. What? Yeah, this is why I don't buy this April. April O'Neil's supposed to be a news reporter. Not a high, not a black high school kid. That looks like she's in middle school. And also looks like a damn hobo. Like, the turtles are characters that yeah, you want to look up to. Not look down to them. And just think they're complete pussies. And also, the story was even changed. Heck, like, there's no Shredder or Foot Clan here. Just this organization that wants to milk the turtles. Briefly. And it never gets recognized again. After Splinter rescues them, never gets recognized. Never gets bought up. They just forget it because the mutants are the focus. Leo gets pushed around a lot here. That's why I call him a pussy here. And while he sees his brothers not listening as much, he's much more than that. Ralph, Raphael, one, there's times when, one or two times when he is the Raph we know, he doesn't like any of their Raphaels, he just has two modes of anger, aggression, that's it, he just sounds like this bored grump that literally just tries to be Nelson from the Simpsons, just doesn't feel like him at all, Donnie's way too much of a nerd than anything who likes BDS and anime, and there's no appearance of his technology. I thought Donatello was supposed to be the one who activates all the technology and stuff. And he has shitty glasses. Like in the Michael Bay movies. And Mikey is Mikey, but just cringier than the other Mikeys. There's Mikeys that actually are funny. The 2007, 2003, and the 90s Mikey. All great Mikeys there. No, I am not counting the crappy one from 2014 that farts in his brother's faces. Like, back to that twerk joke with Mikey. If you guys thought, yeah, and I thought, like, Michelangelo getting stuck in a tunnel in the 2014 film and farting in his brother's faces was, cr was gross and cringy enough. Now we need to see Mikey twerking his butt at the camera for three seconds like, and look like he's wearing a thong. Or probably forgot to unpick his wedgie. Or just doesn't care about it. Yeah. It's like they don't understand Mikey's humor nowadays. They probably think his humor is all toilet humor and butt humor when it's not. <sighs> Family. <clears throat> we get it, guys. It's 2023. But why not just make, like, April O'Neil here a new character? Make this black version of April O'Neil a different character. Not April O'Neil. Because this is not April O'Neil. They deviated off the story anyway, and it's a ridiculous choice. Some of the great, some of these voice actors in this movie are also great. But most of them, most of the characters they play have no style. And it's merging a cringe mess with no jokes that are funny. And one of the worst twists, and one of the worst redemptions yet for some of these villains. And what they did to Splinter here was not forgivable. 
He's not the master you know and love. He's awfully designed because he's got curly gray hair, glasses too, wears now a shirt and pants. This is not Splinter either. The Splinter I know wears a robe. Yeah, he still has a beard, but no hair. He's got a beard. He's fine. He's got a bit of a beard. Yes. He had a beard in the 1990 movie. He had a beard in the 2007 film. And I think he did have a beard in the 2003 series. But yeah. And his dialogue is poor. Despite, and despite Jackie Chan trying his best with him. It's just poor here. And he even has a cringe romance with one of the mutants I'll get to later. And there's the one turtle. Oh, wait, no. There's actually four. They all have the same personalities. They don't have any different personalities here, unlike several of their adaptations. They're just a single style, and they're poorly voiced. Most of the voices suck here. The jokes are terrible. And the amazing team at T you grew up loving were replaced by these toddler turtles that act like losers on TikTok. Or ones in school who probably get pelted with dodgeballs, get swirlies, get stuffed into lockers, or get or get atomic wedgies, or heck, maybe even get in suitcase wedgies like in Shazam. Like those kids. Those outcast bully kids in school that don't fit in. And just pure stupid as they're pointless. Nothing landed. Like there's there's even a scene where they're watching. An outdoor movie screening of Ferris Bueller's Day Off in the beginning. And I was like, get that great movie out of your piece of shit. Yeah. That's my favorite John Hughes movie. Let's just piss me off further, Seth. Yeah, Nickelodeon can piss me off further. Let's put one of my favorite comedies of the 80s in your piece of shit. Nice. Great movie had to be thrown into this piece of shit. The decision making, makers of this film just mess everything up. The art style gets boring so fast. It's not enjoyable to watch. The heart and soul of the franchise was dead and this just spat in the face of every fan here. Like, I'm so sick and fed up of every animated film now that feels like it needs to now copy into the Spider-Verse. And I don't get how somehow people are fine with that. Stop copying other movies. It works with Into the Spider-Verse, guys, because it's supposed to feel like a real-life comic on the big screen. It was not done to introduce a new animation style. Do people not realize that? Then again, it's Hollywood, and Hollywood likes to copy everything that's successful. <sighs> the humor in this just felt like it was made for 12-year-olds, and only 12-year-olds. Trying too hard to be cool for 12-year-old kids. Painfully hard. And when it comes to the action in this, it completely failed the animation. Most of the action was just chaotic, choppy, no weight to any of it. And for a movie with Ninja in the title, there's little action as a whole. And it didn't feel like Ninja stuff. Just people getting and stuff getting tossed around and then just getting knocked out from that. From being lightly tossed. And yeah... And yeah, people can people can also say the turtles sound too young, Don, because it's an origin story. Get it through your head, idiot. Just because this is an origin story, that doesn't change my mind. It an origin story does not make these versions of them less annoying to watch. They lack individuality. It focused way too much on them as a collective. With no personality, just sounding like TikTokers, and you really get much time with them as individual characters. They're together in every single scene. No time to do them separately. The 1991 did that. Like the very first film from 1990 actually gave them time to show them as characters when they're separated, not teaming up. Raphael even goes to in the beginning of the 1990 film, Raphael does goes to a movie alone in disguise. Or even rage quits on the game. Or gets in a fight with Leo in the 1990 film. And he just backs off. For a bit. And then comes back getting attacked by the Foot Clan. Right here. So we got time to so we got some time to spend with them as separate characters. Not just being a whole team that is just one whole blended in character. With no personalities. 
Like, this, this story, though, this had potential to be pretty deep. And the first 15 to 20 minutes seemed to set up some heavy themes despite still being a bad movie. They don't give those themes the space to breathe and develop, and they just forget about them, so in the end, they just felt bland and cliche. Like... The film even felt boring, too. It's apparently an hour and a half, and it felt twice as long. Scenes just drag on, jokes drag on, there's no stakes. There's this big global level threat, but it's not even that dragged out. Like, even the 1990 film did a better global level threat. With the Shredder. And the Secret of the Ooze, Secret of the Ooze even had a global threat. With the Shredder. Even Secret of the Ooze, it was done better. People, if people want to shit on Secret of the Ooze... Secret of the Ooze was still better developed than whatever this was. And the jokes just constantly undercut any real tension. And the finale was rushed and being too long. Like. And. Yeah. Like seriously. And another thing about Splinter I should have mentioned. Splinter also ends up having a romance with this gibberish talking mutant named Superfly. Which feels gross, because Superfly is not a rat. Superfly is a mutated fly, and Splinter is a rat. That just look that looks nothing like Splinter at all. Just looks like some weird hillbilly dude wearing a rat costume. And you want to know, like, and there's this gig where. Where they not only the turtles not only want to go to the real world, they want to go to school. The turtles never go to school. So speaking of that problem, you want to know how this movie ends. April overcomes her anxiety of throwing up in front of a camera for three minutes. A commander a news broadcast to explain the mutants good attention to the citizens of New York come to their aid. Leonardo finds his voice as a leader, utilizing Michelangelo's gift for improvisation, Donatello's intelligence, and Raphael's rage to drop a canister of TCRI retro mutagon to Superfly's blowhole. Yeah, Superfly is the main villain this one, not Shredder. Turning back into a collection of normal animals. Reconciling with, and they, the turtles then reconcile with Splinter. And, and them, April, and the mutants are celebrated by the city, and the mutants soon move into the sewers with them, even Bebop and Rocksteady, who are supposed to be villains, not working, not living with the turtles. All of a sudden. Splinter and Scumbug, I mean, her name was Scumbug, Splinter and that mutant Scumbug fall in love, and the turtles enroll at April's high school, or they're embraced as heroes. And then the mid credit scenes revealed that the Turtles enjoy the high school life. Donatello found the computer club. Raphael and the wrestling team. Michelangelo takes up improv comedy. <laughs> and Leonardo, who has creepily developed a crush on April. Uh -huh. Ew. Gross. Why is that a thing? No! So, they're going to imply bestiality when they get older in this version? <laughs> Alright. So after that, joins her investigation into TCRI. And the five of them enjoy themselves at prom. Probably, yeah, they, it's pretty much, I guess they're also the kind that probably want to get naked at prom. And dip their bodies into punch. Or pour punch all over their naked bodies to look attractive. <laughs> Probably. And they're under surveillance from Utram. Who now hold the unmuted Superfly captive. And they plan to recapture the turtles by enlisting the aid of the mysterious Shredder. So we finally see Shredder here. Who is never in the film. Except he's teased for a sequel. How do you even know if a sequel is even going to happen? Like, the movie is literally on its opening week, but they're planning one anyway, despite not even waiting for the box office first. That fast, like... Like, can't you guys just wait for the opening weekend and wait for the box office before you start priming a franchise out of this? And yeah, the Turtles going to high school? No, I don't buy that shitty concept. I don't know how people praise that concept. The Turtles never go to school in their adaptations. None of them. They got their education from Splinter. 
by training with their weapons. The turtles don't go to school and they live in the shadows. They stay in the shadows. They're not Sun Z citizens. Like, in Secret of the Ooze, guys, throughout the 1990 and its sequel, they're told not to blow their cover. They're told not to be seen. In the end of Secret of the Ooze, they're seen by the public and praised. And Splinter's like, were you out? And the turtles deny it. No. But Splinter shows them a newspaper. And he, and, he make, and he actually does punish them for blowing their cover by making them do cartwheel flips. And that's how Seeger Lose ends. So the Turtles actually got in trouble for blowing their cover and getting themselves exposed. And going against Splinter's back. It was, during, it was likely because of the vanilla ice scene from Secret of the Ooze, so. And even that, even this vanilla ice scene in Secret of the Ooze was actually way funnier than whatever any jokes in this were. Is there a good quality though? Yeah. The reason why this is not, I don't think this is as bad as 2014 or Ninja Turtles 3. Because Superfly, I thought Ice Cube did enjoyably well in his performance as Superfly. And the first two minutes started off fine, but it just goes downhill after that, and that's where all the bad stuff happens. And it, cause it, and most of the good stuff just never develops from there, and it goes nowhere. So yeah, and Jackie Chan, despite the shitty design Splinter, he was fine as Splinter, alright? I thought he was fine as Splinter for what he was given. I don't think he was bad. If he had a better designed splinter, and an actually good splinter that doesn't fall in love with Scumbug or look like a guy, old guy, hillbilly guy in a rat suit, and look like an actual splinter, an actually proper design master splinter, then I probably would have liked this splinter. And he probably would have been a good splinter, had he been done right. Other than that, that's it for good qualities. And this would have to be my third least favorite Team NT film. 2014 and 3 are still the two worst ones, no doubt. But this was still bad. Really, really bad. If you ever have a good Team NT film in the future, it ne which I doubt we will, another good one ever again, it needs to go back to the tone of the 1990 film and be live action. Look like the Turtles. No, not the ugly ass Shreks from the Michael Bay movies where they look like, where they look like as if some creepy designed Shreks from 2014 without their masks. Do not make them look all bulgy and nasty like wrestlers combined with Shrek's bodies. Because the live action film from 1990 will always be the best out of all of them. Everyone's like, Nude Mayhem is the best one. Fuck off. Mew Mayhem is not the best one. I don't know what movie you guys watched. I don't know how people could defend this. And think this is better than 1990. What a joke. So in the end, Mutant Mayhem is a strong avoid for most TMNT fans. Yes, this is going to give me controversy, but I don't give a damn, guys. I'm not here to copy every single person's opinion on a movie. I'm here to give my honest reviews and my honest opinions, and that's that. Okay? I'm not here to copy every single user just to look cool in front of a user I like. That's not normal, guys. It's called This is called honesty, and I prefer to stick with honesty. Anyways, that's it for my rant on Mutant Mayhem. If you're wondering how I'm going to rank Mutant Mayhem, here's how I'm going to rank this movie. So overall, if you want to see cringe versions of the turtles sounding like pre teenagers and being dumb idiots, then I would recommend avoiding this movie and sticking with the good films of the 2003 series instead. And if you're wondering how I'm going to rank Mutant Mayhem, I'm going to give Mutant Mayhem a 5 out of 10. Alright, there we go. Honestly, now that I think about it, this has been quite a crappy summer for movies. The only good s movies we got this summer were Across the Spider-Verse, Asteroid City, what else can I think of? There's Rise of the Beast was decent. Oh, I, can, I can include it. 
Oh boy, what else can I... I'm trying to think of other movies we got this summer that weren't crap. Oh yeah, Oppenheimer. Right, I almost forgot about Oppenheimer. The only really four great stuff, the only four great blockbusters we had this summer were Crossfireverse, Oppenheimer, Asteroid City, Rise of the Beasts. Okay? And I don't think August is going to be better. I heard The Meg 2 is shit. I heard Haunted Mansion was boring. I mean, Haunted Mansion wasn't even that good. It even bombed. So, I still need to see that horror film talk to me. Not sure if I'll have time to because I'm going away next week, but when I get the chance, but I hope it ends up being one of A24's best and makes up for whatever the hell Bo's Afraid was. And yeah, but other than that, guys, this summer has sucked for films. And there's been like four exceptions, and that's about it. So, yeah. Till then, guys, that'll be it for this rant. Thank y'all for watching. Like this, want to see more. Don't forget to like, subscribe to Donji Corleone.